come out in the name of the 97 I got in New Testament survey? <laughs> I think we need to pray for these guys, for, for Russ and Maeve. I think we need to lay hands on them and ask the Lord to give them a little vision. You know, so they could think up something to do. I'm like, lis listening to, to what they do is like watching an epic movie credit, you know, roll by. It's like for 29 minutes, all did this and this and this. And I'm, when do you sleep? I see that look. I told Maeve I think she needs to change her career. She missed her calling. She is supposed to be a stand-up comedian. It's the truth. If you haven't had opportunity, I've got too much junk up here today. Let me see if I can get rid of some of it. If, if you haven't had much of an opportunity to be around them or around her in person, then you can't fully appreciate what I'm saying when I say she really missed her calling and being a stand-up comedian <laughs> today. <laughs> I can't even start. <laughs> um, healing. Hallelujah. <laughs> I listen, I came to get something tonight. I don't know what I'm going to get. But I came to get something. Janie lost it. <laughs> oh, Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. You need a bigger pulpit if you're going <laughs> to. Just a couple of things. Don't get serious over there, Janie. When he had completed all his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. And a centurion slave who was highly regarded by him was sick and about to die. When he heard about Jesus, say when he heard. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. And when they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him. For he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. We have just entered into the most unusual story. Because the demographics of people that are engaged in this moment, that are drawn to the magnetism of the king of glory and suddenly becoming a working part of his community, his manifest kingdom in the earth, are all people who should be natural enemies. A commander in the oppressor's kingdom that has invaded and is basically running the country and using a political hack as their puppet to rule over the Jews, a commander, a representative, an ambassador for that kingdom, who is somehow friends with the religious leaders of the nation his kingdom is oppressing, and while they are there to take over, this guy is actually building them one of their religious institutions to what? Spread their religion? This makes no sense. And nobody is immune to what happens in life. This man with, great, with all the power of Rome can't do a thing. To heal his servant, his slave, the centurion. Can't do a thing to heal his servant. So he has a need. He goes to the people that are supposedly beneath him, the Jews, to seek to get his need met. And they go 
to this guy that has come on the scene that in most circles that they represent is a man who is a threat to everything that they represent. It's an awesome story. He sent the centurion, he sent some of the Jewish elders asking Jesus to come and save the life of his slave. And they came to Jesus. They earnestly implored him saying, he's worthy for you to grant this to him. For he loves our nation and it was he who built us our synagogue. And Jesus started on his way. Look at your neighbor and say, he started on the way. <laughs> when God begins to move, something happens. The Bible says that creation has literally been groaning, waiting to see those ones that have been created, recreated in the resurrection, in the image of this son. And we read last night from Colossians 1 in the Message Bible, how it says that he holds all things together and he's causing everything to organize itself into vibrant harmonies. The resurrection is the rebuke of the law of thermodynamics that says that everything in the universe is rushing toward chaos. Death. This is the resurrection before he was killed. Jesus started on his way with them. Those words have glory on them tonight for us. Tell your neighbor, he's about to do something. He's headed our way. He's headed your way. He has started on his way. <laughs> hey! And when he was not far from the house, tell your neighbor he's not far. Oh, Lord. He's very near. He is very near. He is very near to every need. He is very near to the answer to every prayer. And by the way, for the people of prayer, Russ, last night, I had that vision during worship of the firemen with the little things that were <laughs> shooting, these little spurts of fire, and they were, they were, you know, spaced apart all along the southern border of Canada and were starting this fire line to fight fire with fire. If you remember, I said, Lord, who are they? He said, they're the people of prayer. I mean, Maeve and I are a little slow. She told me today that she was wearing her faith helmet on backwards. <laughs> I said, Maeve, turn that thing around. He threw the back of it. <laughs> We're a little slow on the uptake. It says, when he was not far from the house, tell your neighbor he's not far now. The centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself further. For I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. Already you see these expressions. This is really fascinating. The people who knew this centurion said, oh, he's worthy. The centurion who knew himself said, oh, I'm not worthy. Jesus wasn't being driven or influenced moved by either of those opinions he was on his way and as he was moving his glory was going ahead of him in the unseen realm and we know this because of what we're about to read so far people are moving people are talking people have agreed together they've, they've started to come into agreement with the petition, the answer to the need, to the petition of the centurion, of the life of the centurion's servant. I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. 
For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But just say the word. Let's say that. Just say the word. Just say the word. Just say the word. Just say the word. I shared with you last night one of the testimonies of Mahesh and I's life where the Lord spoke to us and said, you'll have a son named Amaran. I'll make the rod of his life bloom. And I told you all the details of something that was utterly impossible and improbable in the natural, but there was a word of the Lord. And it was a simple word. I'll do it. I'll do it. (laughs) Just say the word and my servant will be healed. And then one of the great principles of the way miracles, the anointing, the kingdom of God, this kingdom that Daniel saw that began with a stone, if you remember, cut out without hands from a mountain and flung from heaven, right? Onto the thresholds, the foundations of all the greatest kingdoms, political kingdoms, kingdoms of man in the earth. Remember the vision of Daniel? And he saw this stone made without hands, flung out of heaven. It It hit the feet of this massive statue that was all of the great world kingdoms. And suddenly, they began to totter and fall. And at the same time, that stone began to rise where? Not in heaven. In the earth. That stone began to rise in the earth, and Daniel saw it. It continued to rise and grow until it became a mountain that filled the whole earth. Come on. The whole earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. The resurrection is the rebuke of the anticipation of mankind that the world is moving towards chaos and death. Because the kingdom of God is people. It's people who know the king. And it's advancing and it's growing and will fill the whole earth. Um, a couple of statistics on that. You remember the story where um, the Israelites were commissioned by God to become the great evangelists, to begin to take over territories and nations. And um, When they came to a certain region, spies were sent out. And the spies came back and said, the dudes in there are huge and we're just grasshoppers in our eyes. I have observed that there has been a kind of mentality that that particularly the Western church has allowed the humanists and the public media to put on us that we're just grasshoppers. We're just diminishing. That Christianity as a force in the world has been spent. You know what? Pentecostal Christianity is the fastest growing worldwide spiritual and religious phenomena today. That's the truth. The statistics are there. Of approximate uh, two and a quarter billion Christians in the world today, 
600 million identify themselves as Pentecostals and Charismatics. If we could suddenly tonight get a glimpse of all of the Pentecostal and Charismatic Christians, that's not, we're not talking about even the evangelicals and all of the, the rest of the, the Orthodox and all them, okay? We're just talking about a piece of this mountain that's living, that's spreading, that's overtaking the earth in relationship to the king. The kingdom is people. And if we could get a glimpse tonight, I guarantee you, it would so infuse your sense of identity and vision and mission and community that you would just, oh, you wouldn't be feeling like a grasshopper when you get up in the morning and your hair looked like mine did today. <laughs> 600 million identify themselves as Pentecostals and Charismatics. Another 285 million are Bible-believing evangelical Christians. Millennials, this is the statistics, all the stuff they say about millennials. Check it out. In terms of millennials and the kingdom of God, millennials are sharing the gospel more than any other generation, particularly on college campuses. You know the devil is a liar. He's always been a liar. He will always be a liar. We are not grasshoppers. <laughs> the mountain is growing. Muslims are converting by tens of thousands through supernatural encounters with Jesus. Don't even need a human missionary because Jesus has started on the way. China is on track to become the world's most Christian nation. In 1900, there were approximately 10 million Christians in Africa. By 2000, there were 360 million. And by 2025, conservative estimates see that number rising to 633 million just on the continent of Africa. What does the news say? Islam has taken over. Mm -mm. Because this gospel of the kingdom of God is advancing. <laughs> it will fill the whole earth. Say fill. Look at your neighbor. Say fill. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The same estimates put the number of Christians in Latin America in 2025 at 640 million. In Asia, at 460 million. And another statistic that we don't frequently think of. 160,000 Christians around the world are martyred for their faith every year. Every year. This gospel is real. This gospel, this great not religion relationship that we have the privilege, the wonder of being drawn into because Jesus had something in mind and he started on his way towards our house. Be encouraged tonight, saints. Take a breath. Be refired and refilled and infused. Hallelujah. Mm, say, Jesus has started on his way. Hallelujah. So the centurion says, I am also a man placed under authority with soldiers under me. And I say, this one go and he goes and another come and he comes and to my slave do this and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he marveled. Now, Mark, the centurion and Jesus have never seen one another yet, right? The only interchange that's going on are all these people that are engaged relationally at some point and are now aware of this need and have come into this conversation. You tracking with me? The centurion, the guy who's dying, and the master have not yet seen one another or spoken to one another face to face. All of this activity.
activity of God has started on the way simply by the various engagement of the individual, simple, plain, everyday people who are in relationship. Come on. We're going somewhere with this. Come on. Say, Jesus has started on the way. He's not far from the house. Now, when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him. He turned and said to the crowd following, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. And when those who had been sent, look at your neighbor say, you've been sent. Ask your other neighbor, did you ever pray that silly prayer? Here am I, Lord, send me. Ask your neighbor, did you ever pray that silly prayer? Here am I, Lord, send me. When those who had been sent returned to the house, has Jesus gotten to the house yet? Uh Uh-uh. He just started on the way. And a bunch of people are, you know, engaged. Jesus is on the way. He's coming. When they returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. When did that miracle happen? How did that miracle happen? Come on, saints. Are you tracking with me here tonight? You know, this is one of those things. How many billions of times have you read this thing in the Bible? And just, I'm telling you, it was two weeks ago, Mahesh, Mahesh and Joshua Mills, actually. And they were doing a miracle service together in our conference. The same one you heard Noel's testimony that night, that healing service. Noel was sitting in the middle, and there was a word about somebody in a coma. And her uh, nephew, Peter, was in a coma in uh, New York City. And she was sitting in a church meeting in Charlotte. And Joshua Mills and Mahesh Chavda were hosting the presence for a miracle service. And at a certain point, Mahesh just said, who's got a friend or a loved one in a coma? And Noelle, if she had been sitting anywhere but right on the front row in front of the preacher, she wouldn't have raised her hand. But she raised her hand. And those who had been sent gathered around, just like we did last night, and prayed for those folks who had folks in the hospital. Come on. Come on. We're getting engaged. We're getting engaged. God is shifting our understanding to see what he's doing and how he does his stuff. And recognize that every joint must fully supply that little measure or that great measure of faith and cooperation, of obedience and expectation. The kingdom of God is advancing and creation is groaning in travail, waiting to see us stand up and say, we're not grasshoppers anymore. Mahesh read this scripture. And dong, it's like a brick. Oh. Oh, Lord. Well. If you weren't here last night, sorry. By the way, hello, Florida, (laughs) and uh, you other places. (laughs) Jesus has started on his way. (laughs) You know, they're rolling around, jumping up and down. Ah! (laughs) Um, And Mahesh read this scripture. I've read this story a zillion times. I've heard it preached a zillion times. Doesn't that, for the first time in my life, I went, wait a minute. 
that miracle happened just because people in relationship to people in relationship to the need and the master engaged in the message and suddenly the miracle happened and Jesus didn't even have to get in the house. Those who were sent played their part. This is our encouragement tonight, friends. We each have a part daily, and you never know. It is just simply being willing to follow the lead. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The whole of creation is groaning and travail, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. It's as simple as that. It's not some deep, far out, even that, the, all that supernatural. Nobody did a supernatural thing. And something supernatural happened. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. Woo. So, we got a prayer request tonight. We got a prayer request from Toronto. From someone that wants us to pray for Katerina. Yeah, to pray for Katerina. She needs a liver and kidney transplant. She's currently critically ill in hospital for the last 11 weeks. So I'm going to hand Katerina's picture to this little group of those who have been sent. And the rest of us who have been sent, we are just going to take our encouragement from the way Jesus does his business and say, Katerina, Jesus has started on his way. Come on, saints. Go ahead and pray. Yeah. Prophesy. Release now. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, Father, I thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you have creative power. We thank you, Father God, for new kidneys. We thank you, Father God, for new liver to come into this small child's body. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for breakthroughs to happen in that room right now. In the name of Jesus. Oh, in the name of Jesus, Father, I thank you for breakthroughs to happen. In Jesus' name, Father, we thank you, Lord. Breakthrough, Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, that according to your will and according to your name tonight, right now, Father, it is done, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you, Father. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, Father, we thank you for the, the word that you send, Lord, the word that you sent to that centurion servant, Lord. We thank you that the same word that framed the heavens and the earth, the same word that created this little girl's kidneys and liver in the first place, that same powerful word, that same creative word, that same miraculous word, Father God, is going and touching that little girl, Lord God. It's not by power and it's not by might. It's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. We thank you, that Lord, that your spirit is not hindered. Father, your word is not negated. We thank you for release of it tonight. In the name of Jesus, Lord, amen. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Yeah. Now, are you related to her? She just She's my best friend. She's your best friend. She's my best friend. Well, praise the Lord. We believe the Lord is encouraging us through this story tonight to believe together with you and with her family for Katerina. So, and as a little gift, a gift from Ash, healing made simple. That's for you. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Huh. <laughs> Get engaged. Get in the business. Just do your part. We each have a part. A um, couple of other things we have out at the, the book table. 
Um, a few years ago, Mahesh was sitting in his study on a Saturday night preparing for the Sunday message, and all of a sudden, an angel actually appeared, like physical, like you could touch him. And uh, that does not happen every Wednesday and twice on Fridays at our house. Um, and uh, this angel, when he appeared, was smoking with the heat of battle. He, he looked like a just giant mix between a uh, Marine and Mr. Clean. I don't know if you know who Mr. Clean is, <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, uh, a Marine and Mr. Clean. <laughs> just grinning from ear to ear, joy busting off of him, and he was smoking literally from the heat of battle. He'd just come from battle. And um, Mahesh looked at this angel. Wah, is there looking at Mahesh. And Mahesh sees him the minute Mahesh sees him, the angel says, how big is your chair? I told Mahesh, Mahesh, if an angel showed up and looked at me and said, how big is your chair? I would get right to the treadmill. <laughs> how big? You know, if he'd shown up to a woman, she would have reacted in a different way than what Mahesh did. <laughs> how big is your chair? Ask your neighbor, how big is your chair? <laughs> Whoa, king size. <laughs> and um, the minute the angel said, how big is your chair? He disappeared. And uh, in, the wor in the atmosphere where the angel had appeared were words of an old hymn. Come thou almighty king, help us thy praise to sing, or thy name to sing. Father all glorious, or all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. But when Mahesh heard it, it wasn't in the tune that he was familiar with of the hymn in his former Baptist, you know, life. Before he got baptized in the Holy Ghost, they still don't know. He's still an ordained Baptist mission, uh, minister. Um, but anyway, that this song was hanging in the air. And then suddenly the, the scripture from Psalm, God is enthroned on the praise of his people, came flying out of that presence. And Mahesh understood what the Lord was saying is, make the place that you dwell with me, that place of my throne in you, make it big. Make me king big where you are. And how do you do that? Well, yeah, petition and prayer and supplication and things, all that stuff is good. But you know what? God sits down as king on praise. God sits down as king on praise. <laughs> Say enthroned. Enthroned. So here's another one that's out there. This is all the scriptures on praise. It's the good looking evangelist reading it to music. Uh, reading the scriptures to music with a lot of testimonies. A story about this angel and other things on there. So just a little gift right there. How many of you weren't here last night? Okay, you don't count on this one. Everybody else? <laughs> yeah, the next time I say, where's your sign? <laughs> You're going to have to explain to these other folks what that means. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lord. So... So, we are entering into, I mentioned last night, we're entering into uh, the most important season in the life current and in the history and tradition of the existent church. That is the Easter season. The season that marks the events that changed human history and the course of creation forever. 
when God became man and still was God in the flesh, in the earth, the logos, the backbone, the very background, the existent one of the whole of the universe embodied in a person as a human being in the earth. And John says, the word, the logos, and he used that word on purpose because, as you know, the Greek and Roman philosophers of the day were, they had, they had uh, uh, since they're, you know, for a long time, they had come up with this concept that there is something behind the moral order of all of creation. And if we can discover what that is, and they called it the logos, the word. There's a word behind all of this. And if we can discover it and align ourselves with it, we'll be right along the grain of the purpose of the universe. And in that, find our purpose. Huh. John said, guess what? It's him, the word, made flesh. And I love the way Peterson puts it in a message. It said, he moved right into the neighborhood. <laughs> the word became flesh, and he moved right into the neighborhood. Look at your neighbor and say, he started on his way. He's not far from the house. <laughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah. So, Easter is on its way. Nehesh is funny. He said, you know, we wallow in Christmas. We need to start wallowing in Easter. So then he started trying to rewrite Christmas carols with Easter themes. <laughs> Silver bell. And I was just sitting at the table. I said, Mahesh. The only Easter song I ever learned when I was a kid, here comes Peter Cottontail, hopping down the bunny trail, hippity hoppity. <laughs> I think that's another gospel, but. <laughs> but Easter, Easter, it means something. The course of history changed, and it occurred in phases, in real human phases. It began, if you will, with the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And it's interesting the way the Gospels record this event. And some of them say more and some of them say less about it. But it's a, a stunning and powerful prophetic revelation and fulfillment of Scripture and of the prophecies of Scripture. As Jesus enters into Jerusalem, he becomes the Word in the flesh, fulfilling Zechariah 9. Behold, your king comes, lowly and riding on a donkey. Psalm 118, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, save now, Lord. Hosanna, send now prosperity. The fulfillment of the shadow, which was Solomon, when another son of David, a usurper, rode into the capital of Israel on a war horse and took over illegitimately the throne. And David was approached by his wife and said, that's not the legitimate king. The Lord has spoken already and said, "Who Solomon will sit on this throne. And Solomon came in humble on a donkey and was anointed as king over Israel. It's really amazing. Come on, people. These are not fables and legends. We have been incorporated in to the greatest, most marvelous, majestic, wondrous historical events. And not just events of history. Unfolding adventure, epic of God in redemption of creation. Woo! Jesus rides in. The day he would have come into Jerusalem 
was the very day. And in fact, the crowd that had gathered on the streets would have gathered there because it was approaching Pesach, Passover. And the crowd would have been gathered because today the high priest would be leading the national lamb down from the temple, from Olivet, down into the temple to be put on display in public in the temple for four days. And the, the nation would have been exultant in anticipation because they knew that when the national lamb was slain, the nation would be atoned for for another year. So all of their hopes of forgiveness and reconciliation and grace for another year were resting on the back of this woolly lamb that would be led to the temple. And right behind that scene, came Jesus and his disciples. Jesus riding on a donkey. Oh. And it's interesting. It says that, <laughs> that the crowd, and in fact, Luke makes it clear. It says a multitude of Jesus' disciples I sent ones. I just read you some statistics. There's a multitude of disciples. There's a multitude of disciples. And the Bible says God is enthroned on the praises of his disciples. Friends, it is time for us to get our praise on. And when Jesus enters into Jerusalem on this event, it says the multitude of disciples began praising and rejoicing with a loud voice. Jesus was on the way into the city. Into the house. Come on. And it's interesting. Luke says. Right away. The Pharisees said. Tell your disciples to shut up. I will be more undignified than this. <laughs> right. Isn't that the spirit now, the spirit of the age, especially in the West? I just read you to listen, Christianity is growing everywhere. There's one diminishing demographic. It's white Western Protestants, literally by numbers. White Western people. Because suddenly they decided, you know, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm not going to get married. I'm going to have kids. That's so old school. I've got to find myself. Discover my true purpose. I'm seeking my destiny. Oh, and so let's write worship songs about it. A boom. Yeah, that one snuck up on you, didn't it? Have you noticed modern quote unquote Christian music? It's a lot about I, me, and mine. Not so much about him. <laughs> Who are we worshiping anyway? <laughs> Glory well. Okay. There is a movement that is occurring now. And the Lord is awakening us. He's awakening us to his glory. And it's time for his disciples to get their praise on and make their voice loud. Jesus is on his way. And he did come into the city. And as you know, the Gospels say he was on display in the temple for four days, teaching, preaching. He drove. When he came in, something else got driven out. Hallelujah. <laughs> into the temple, remember? So there is an exchange going on. The more filled we are with him and his presence, the more all the other stuff has to be driven out. And that's why it's important for each one of us to be fully awakened and alive and engaged in the Holy Ghost every single day. Not being religious, but living together in that vibrant harmony that creation is finally going, oh, there they are. Now we have hope because this mountain is filling the whole earth.
and Jesus is the king of the mountain. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the triumphal entry, and then, of course, we know that it unfolded in the events surrounding the Last Supper, the fulfillment of Psalm 122 and Isaiah 53 and all of those things eventually as he went to Gethsemane the night before he was crucified. He agonized there in prayer. I believe that he won the victory, the battle over the weakness of his own human reality there and laid himself down there in the garden. And by the time the guards came by torchlight and took him to prison, I believe he had set his face like a flint for the joy set before him. And he was looking through the end of himself as that man, the last Adam, in order that he might become the second man. The old would be gone. The new will have come. And friends, the mystery is that not only did God have each of us in mind, according to what the Apostle Paul says in Acts 17, before he created the material creation we see around us, he had us each in mind. He knew when we would live, where we would live, our family line. It would all be arranged in order that we might each begin to awaken in this vibrant symphony and seek our way toward him. And find him. A light shining in the darkness. Not only. Did he have that in mind. But in a mystery we will never comprehend. Except that God is God. The Bible says. That each of us. Who have come to faith in Jesus Christ. Hundreds thousands of years. After that physical event. That in a way we don't understand. We actually were in him in the cross when he died. And we were in him when he came out of the grave. And we are in him as he has gone up and sat down on his throne. And scripture says he will sit there in that big chair that is built on your praises. And he will rule until all of his enemies have been put under his feet. Come on, friends. Come on, disciples, sent ones. It's time to rejoice and lift up a praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory. I'm going to plug one of our products. This is our book called The Power of the Cross, the Epicenter of Glory. And this is my favorite book that we have had the privilege to write. But it's an unusual book. It's filled with the theology of the cross from scripture. Explaining again what scripture says occurred in this cosmic spectacle. The crucifixion of the son of glory. And it's also combined with a little bit of creative fiction. I imagined persons named in the Bible, described in relationship with Jesus, and I made up a couple. And these would be people who were witnesses of the events of those days that we now celebrate in the Easter season. 
one of the witnesses that I thought of, you know, if you go to the Garden of Gethsemane today, there are trees there that were there the night Jesus came and prayed. And whenever I go to the Garden of Gethsemane in Jerusalem, I feel like I'm walking among old ancient people. That they heard him. They saw him. And so I imagined if one of those trees could speak to me as I was sitting in the Garden of Gethsemane a few years ago, what he would say to me about the night Jesus came and fell at his roots and prayed through. Anyway, some fun stuff in here for Easter. But I also, <laughs> back in the day when our son Aaron was still living in our house, I told you the story of Aaron, right, last night. You will have a son, name him Aaron, right? The little guy that weighed less than a pound was doomed for death and today is a bodybuilder and a successful artist in film and a lover of Jesus and a chick magnet and, and hallelujah. Mostly a lover of Jesus and a successful artist and a bodybuilder. But anyway, um, back in the day before he was out of the house, we crucified him every Good Friday. Because he kind of has that Middle Eastern look and, you know, got a little beard going and stuff. And so we used him as our Jesus. But I will never forget. <laughs> we did. <laughs> I will never forget the first year we crucified my son. <laughs> and they brought him in, two of our big old, you know, burly ushers came in as the Romans with the whips and stuff, and here came my son carrying that crossbeam, already bloodied and battered, crown of thorns, and his, his clothes barely hanging in rags, almost naked already. And, you know, of course it was pain, but I mean, they had bloodied him up with makeup and stuff. And Mama was sitting on the front row on the side of the aisle, and the ruckus came in, and the soldiers were yelling at him and slapping whips. And, he, you know, he was struggling and staggering. And as he came, and I looked up, and I saw my son staggering under the weight of the cross. And he came, they drove him. And he, when he got right to about here, one of them whipped him, and he fell. And there was so much makeup on him. When he fell, it literally splattered. And the red stuff splashed on me and splashed across the floor. And in that moment, suddenly something happened in my mother's heart. And I identified with an appreciation of the Son of God that had died for me. And I also identified with the witnesses, and particularly with his mother. This is one of the witnesses in my imagination. This is Mary speaking. I kept hoping my eyes lied through their blur of tears, that it was a horrible trance brought on by my worst fears and doubt. I beheld him, and I remember wondering how he would ever recover from the scars his torturers had made on him. Would he ever again have the same face his mother knew so well? He said it like flint, and they sharpened their swords on him. I would have had him back even at the very last had it been possible even if he had never fully recovered and I would have had to nurse him an invalid, at least he would have been at home with me. John assured me on that night he was betrayed that he told them exactly what would take place, though they, like me, didn't grasp it until we witnessed it with our eyes. John told me they fell asleep in spite of themselves in the garden, but I slept little in those days. The air was tense with assurance that we were coming to some kind of climax. But no one could have convinced me it would be that. If I, would, I had known, I would have poisoned Judas' soup one of those times I let him into our house. He never fooled me, and I told my son as much. In those days, I simply thought he was not listening to the warnings of his mother. Eloi! Eloi, lama sabachthani. He was no longer connected to earth. And I was no longer his mother. His outstretched limbs blackened with bruising. Skin hanging in shreds like the corners of a too much used prayer shawl. Ragged, holy, and dyed red with self-giving. 
We're bringing the cosmos back to its creator. My son was bringing many sons home to his father. The brief race we had run together as mother and son, watching him grow up like a green tree was run. The victor's wreath they gave him was a crown of thorns, and he wore it that day like a young hero. The cheering crowd that should have hailed him to his race's end only shouted abuses. And still he ran on toward the finish. My son, the hero. But he was not mine. He belonged instead to him. He belongs to us. Through the cross, we have been brought in to a glorious community, a relationship of eternal inheritors of all that this son possessed before his coming and shall possess at his coming again. We said the truth and effectiveness of the cross is simple enough for a child to enter fully. What happened at the cross when God reconciled the world to himself is a mystery we shall keep discovering for all eternity. Like the cascading force unleashed in the splitting of an atom. You know when atoms are split? The force of that first one poof, is so great that they hit the next atoms and they break. And soon that cascading force is uncontrollable. This is the force of the kingdom of God in the earth. And it began at the cross. Like the force, cascading force unleashed in the splitting of an atom, the action of Calvary will be ever unfolding in power. The glory of the cross is an explosive, eternal, energy creating, continually unfolding revelation of beauty. The cross is the glory of God. In it, we behold him as he really is. Calvary must not be an aversion or a thing of the past. For as long as we have mortal flesh, as long as we seek his power, we will find him at the cross. Because the cross is the singular demonstration of the overwhelming mercy of God, it remains the key to experiencing the glory of God. The cross reveals God as he is. It shows him perfect, self-giving, irresistible, humble, absolutely omnipotent in power, and completely obsessed with his love for us. <laughs> the cross, the epicenter of glory. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. So I know the tone of things this evening is a little different than last evening. I want to say the resurrection of Jesus Christ identifies and answers the five basic needs every human has. Those needs have been identified and defined as meaning, identity, satisfaction, freedom, and hope. And if we start at any one of those points, we will suddenly find ourselves in the middle of a true social discovery of the condition, particularly of the Western culture. But those five basic needs are the basic needs of every human being. And I want to suggest to you that Jesus Christ, in his resurrection, not only identifies and supplies, but gives the resource for the fulfillment of every one of those. And for each of us who are sent, and that means everyone in this room, 
it is time for every disciple to be fully engaged in this vibrant harmony that is the kingdom of God filling the whole earth. It's the resurrection, the resurrection, the resurrection. Christianity explains why those things are a need. Christianity supplies those needs. Christianity gives you the resources to meet those needs. We find in the story in Matthew 17 where Jesus comes and Peter has an encounter with him. And Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And in that moment, that face-to-face encounter, Peter says, well, you know, some are saying you're Elijah. Some are saying you're, you know, a prophet. This and that. You know, that's happening today. Islam says Jesus is something. Buddha, Hindu, says Jesus is something over here. Humanists say Jesus, well, he was a good moral teacher. But who do you say he is? Because you see, when the Father gave Peter the revelation of the Son of Man, the Son of Man gave Peter the revelation of himself. Gave Peter meaning. Gave Peter satisfaction. Gave gave Peter identity. Gave Peter freedom. Gave Peter hope. Changed Peter forever in that moment. This is why I say to you, (laughs) every one of us must be engaged because every human being has these five basic needs and they're all in the word made flesh. It's time for us to loose our voices and preach this good news. I'm not talking about some theology. I'm talking about the fact that each one of us in here who have been awakened have seen him. We've had our Peter encounter that day when, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you. The father has enabled you to see this. God is working in this dynamic. And then he renames him. Remember that? Hallelujah. When you saw him and recognized him by the grace of God, he also saw and recognized and named you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Meaning, there's a phrase, imago Dei, the image of God. It's referring to the fact that human beings have been created in the image of God. Identity. There was a story on the internet a few years ago of an Australian fella who's... Lifetime love had left him, and he just was feeling like his whole everything was purposeless and whatever. He put his life, his friends, his job, his house, his car, all his sporting equipment, he put his life up for auction on eBay. This is a true story. His name was Ian something, I don't remember now, from Australia. And You know what he planned? He thought, man, people are going to come, you know, bidding for my life. I'm going to take that money, and I'm going to go to Paris because I've always wanted to go to the top of the Eiffel Tower. Can you believe it? There are actually persons made in the image of God who have not yet had a revelation and a face-to-face encounter with the God who made them. You know that man needed some meaning. That man needed some satisfaction. That man needed some identity, some freedom, and some hope. Well, somebody bought his life for $400,000. I'm not kidding. Actually happened. 
So he took his money, he packed up, the other guy moved into his friends, his apartment. His, it's the craziest story you ever heard. But friends, this is the world we live in. The harvest is white and you have been sent. You have been sent. Hallelujah. They asked Ian, what they, he said, well, I was a little disappointed. But he did. He packed up and he went to the Eiffel Tower. And nobody's heard of him since. All that because a woman broke up with him. The news you carry is at the root of what it means to be a human being. And every human being is longing for it. Identity is beyond ethnicity, beyond family name, beyond profession or intellect or physical ability. It's what it means to experience being fully human. And you can only experience that when you are made alive spiritually by that work of the Holy Ghost that helps you wake up and say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you get your new name, your new creation. Being made alive spiritually, becoming that triunity. Listen, a lot of the world is walking around like the Walking Dead. You know, we've seen it's been a, the zombies have been a big rage in movies and stories and stuff. Listen, if we could actually see with our spiritual eyes, there'd be a lot of zombies going up and down the grocery store line. They got body and soul, mind, will, and emotions in full tilt. But spiritually, <laughs> right? But you know what it means to be fully human. Because you know him. The word made flesh. Satisfaction beyond physical, emotional desire. And that right there is driving our politics today in the West. Moreover, it's ruling the church Body and soul desire. But you, disciples, sent ones. Creation is yearning for you to be fully engaged. Satisfaction, the ultimate fullness of being relevant. Of being in relationship with something and someone other than and possibly larger, greater, more significant seeming than ourself alone. It comes down to community belonging, not just with persons, but with dynamics. It can only ultimately be fulfilled when you line up with the logos that is behind the whole work. <laughs> Freedom, you know, at first glance, we may think free will. Freedom to choose. Make our own choices is the greatest freedom. In reality, human freedom to love in its highest form. The ability to be constrained by love for another, to act in love for the sake of, of another is the greatest human freedom, the most powerful one. And ultimately, love is only truly fulfilled in the one who is love. Finding ourselves in him and he in us in that love exchange and then beginning to share that out. I was asked to speak at a political rally recently. Did I say this last night? And I got up and I prayed about it and whatever and because the political rally had an agenda. But they'd asked me to come and speak and I was supposed to wrap the whole thing up and close it out with a bang. And uh, I prayed and I got my little thing together and basically I just said, Lord, anoint me. Had my little notes, got up there, did my job. You know what? When I came down, a couple of folks that were actually outside the
the police line that were protesting what was going on at that political rally made a beeline for me. Not to get up in my face, but there was something that drew them. They felt there was an, I, I can't, it was supernatural. I looked up and here came Marsha. Now, I could tell from the look of them knobby knees between the top of them cowboy boots and that short skirt that Marsha wasn't always Marsha. I'm not kidding you. I said, oh, Jesus, help him. Making a beeline for, with this expression of expectation in the eyes, making a beeline for me. I had some of my folks with me. It's not the first time that this has happened, but I'm bringing it up because I think this also is a learning point for us tonight. So Marsha made a beeline for me. And Marsha had an agenda, had a little paper all worked up, all, and was looking for someone with power, someone with a listening ear. And for some reason in all of that crowd, I seemed to be the one. Marsha came, began to, you know, tell me all the petition and what was going on and how come they were out there protesting and so on and so forth. And I just put my hand on Marsha and I looked and I listened genuinely and looked into the eyes of that individual. And when Marsha had said what Marsha wanted to say, I said, well, tell me a little bit about you. Tell me a little bit of your story. Vietnam vet, Marine vet, as a young man, married, ordained Assemblies of God pastor for 25 years, family man for 30 some, and yet in all of that journey, a broken heart, a fragmented sense of meaning, satisfaction, identity, freedom, and hope, and ultimately figured, well, I'm just the wrong sex in the wrong body, and then started down that long and painful and confusing journey, still looking. But I'll tell you what, as I was standing there talking to Marsha, I could tell Jesus was on his way. Jesus was on his way. And some of my folks from my church that were with us, a couple of those things happened that day with some of those folks. And later we were talking and they said, Pastor Bonnie, how do you do that? Because by the time it was over, Marcia was hanging on me, dripping her mascara and her makeup all down my coat and just boo-hooing and snotting on me and you know, no, nobody has ever talked to me like you. And I've never had a sense of hope. And, you know, so my, my folks that watched the whole thing said, how did you, how do you do that? With, with you know, how, uh. and I said, let me tell you what happens. It's not in your mind. It's not in my mind. Literally, something happens where the Holy Spirit comes out as a person. You know, did you ever see the movie The Abyss, right? That water thing that comes up out of the deep and it's like the face of the woman and stuff. Is that the right movie, right? Yeah. I'm just telling you, the Holy Ghost just comes up and out as a person to meet that eternal person in there. And suddenly there's nothing in the visible form or the voice or the funky hair or makeup or any of that stuff it literally is the eternal one looking at the eternal child and you you you're genuinely engaging in a sense of purpose and finding value and affirmation and genuine love and being able to give answers you are the sent ones we are the sent ones of this kingdom, this kingdom that began with a stone cut out without hands, flung out of heaven, the Logos made flesh who moved into the neighborhood 
and we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. It's not a thing of the past. It's a now with us. And if ever our society is showing us our moment has come, it's showing us. It's showing us. We're waiting, we're groaning and travail looking. Where are they? Where are these ones led by the Spirit of God? Right? Glory. I think some scales are falling off our eyes. I think some stone has fallen off our hearts. I think some of our prejudiced opinions. Do I approve of the natural stuff? No, but you know what? The eternal one is after eternal children. You think about Jesus and his encounter with all the sinners and sin sick. The a woman caught in adultery. I mean, talk about a collision of agendas and problems and sin and junk and exposure and stuff and whatever. And they come to Jesus. How are you going to fix this? And he just is Jesus. And it fixes it. Every need, every satisfaction, setting every captive free, giving every person their purpose and meaning, and leaving hope. This is our commission. This is our mission. Your mission, should you choose to accept it. Jesus is on the way. He doesn't even have to get to the house. Because guess what? The sent ones are already engaged in the conversation. Of salvation. And he is going to be working his miracles. In the hearts and minds of men. Hallelujah. And last of all hope. What you believe about your future. Completely determines. What you experience in your present. And once again. This is why I say to every Christian. It is incumbent upon us now to move the dadgum goalpost and stop hoping in deliverance in our bank account or in our relationship or in our ministry this week. Friends, it's the resurrection, the resurrection, the resurrection. We have real hope. It is not in these temporary things that we're placing our Jesus stuff saying, Oh God, if you don't do the miracle, I'm going to lose faith and just go back to the bar. Come on, sons of God, where are you? His victor's wreath was a crown of thorns. And he wore it that day like a champion. God's son, the hero. We're in that season. May the Lord commune with us these next few days and weeks. May we re-encounter the epicenter of glory, the cross. May we find him once again as he is, the God-man in us, in the world. May we be refilled with the breath of resurrection, hope, and glory. The reality that this person, when he came out of the tomb, his own did not recognize him until he spoke. And they went, it's the Lord. So changed and so the same was he. Hallelujah. Perhaps we have 
formed him in our own hearts and minds in some smaller image than he really is. This Easter season, let's take the boundaries off God. Can we do that? Let's take the boundaries off. Let's take the limits off God in this resurrection season. Hallelujah. Glory, Lord. Lift up your heads, O you gates. <laughs> Be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the King of glory will come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. He is the king of glory. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory will come in. They shouted that day as he came, the victor from the tree on Calvary, the victor out of the tomb. The one who had been to hell and back and had loosed the prison bars of death, had fulfilled all the expectation of all the former fathers and mothers who in the old covenant had been looking for the Messiah to come. And they saw him that day when he came in to the place called Sheol. And when he came out, well, you know, in between, he looked at the devil. He said, give me those keys. Come with me, boys and girls. We're going up. Tell your neighbor, we're going up. Imagine. Imagine if you were sitting in synagogue the day after Jesus went up. And old Uncle Silas, who died 20 years ago, and you remember as a little kid, the Shiva and sitting and mourning and burying him. And Uncle Silas comes walking in synagogue and sits down beside you. And you say, what happened? You will never guess, let me tell you. There were people, the Bible says there were people who came out of the grave and then went on to live out the rest of whatever their lives in the midst of the believers. Oh, talk about revival in the church. <laughs> Uncle Silas, give us your testimony once again. What did he look like? What did he say? It's a reality. These are not legends and fairy tales and fables. Hallelujah, and the same spirit that raised him from the dead dwells in you. Hope is for real. It's not clicking our heels together. I do believe, I do believe. Lay hold today of the Logos and find your meaning in him. Lay hold today of the Logos and be fully satisfied. Lay hold today of the Logos and let your identity come clear and full. Lay hold today of the Logos because whom the Son sets free is free. Hold today of the Logos because he is the desire and hope of the nations. Happy Easter. Say 
thing Jesus has started on his way. Hallelujah. <laughs> Whoop. Hey. Hallelujah. Come on. Whack your neighbor on the back. That was a kind of weak whack. If I'd have been in the pew, somebody would have fell down. <laughs> Glory, Lord. Hallelujah, glory. Hallelujah, glory. He came into heaven that day with the offering of his own blood. And he strode across the courts before the throne of the great God and King to offer the offering that would cleanse the sanctuary, the heavens and the earth and open the way forever for every person to know him as he is. Hallelujah. Atonement. Hallelujah. Lord, you're worthy. 
the prayer team tonight. Come on down up front. And if you need prayer before you leave tonight, come on down. Because Jesus is on the way. He's on the way to meet your needs. He's on the way to bring the healing. He's on the way.